Thanks for joining the podcast, dude. Uh, been listening to your music for a little while now. My girlfriend's a huge fan. That's so cool. Tell her what's up. Tell her thanks for listening. And thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks for having me on. This is super dope. Absolutely, man. It's always good to meet another Ableton person, another music nerd of sorts. Yes, yes. Uh, but you have a great voice too, man. And uh, I think your music definitely stands out and you have a unique sound kind of blending a hardcore electronic bass fusion with live vocals. You don't see that super often, especially like in the dubstep world. Thanks so much. I mean, that all came first pretty much. And then all the EDM kind of bass music stuff came, came after it was only natural to kind of fuse them all together, you know? Yeah. And you're originally from Buffalo, New York, right? And then you're in LA now. Yeah. I just moved back to Buffalo actually. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Why the move? If you don't mind me asking, why did you move back? Yeah, I mean, I've been in and out of LA for I think it's been ten years now. So, I mean, a lot has happened there. It's definitely changed a lot, and you know, it's getting kind of pricey. And I like investing in my project a lot, like where whether it be you know music videos or, or stuff that doesn't necessarily make me money back. I think is really helpful for the art. So the the more I can save is the more I can. Uh, can give back and and do more kind of cinematic stuff like that. Yeah, I definitely understand that too, especially starting out. I mean, you've been doing this for a while, but for even other producers starting out, it could be a real grind without seeing any kind of ROI and you just keep pouring money into having people do like artwork for you and video and having a team that you're paying to do all these different things. It can definitely add up. Definitely. And the rent just, just kills you. Yo, I feel that too. I'm in Denver and it's not cheap here either. LA is definitely more expensive, I think. Denver's but, getting getting hotter, isn't it? Yeah, man. Everybody and their grandma is moving here in the last couple <laughs> of years, it seems like. And I keep telling my dog he needs to get a job to start paying rent around here and pitching <laughs> in. He's just, he's lazy. He just sleeps on my couch all day and eats my food. That's so funny. <laughs> I'd love to get to know you a little bit better and just to get to know a little bit of your background with music. Obviously, this is the Ableton Live podcast, so hopefully we can nerd out a little bit too. Yeah. Um, learn some of your production and performance process as well. But yeah, like how did you get started in music? Maybe give us a quick background and then how did that lead you into the wonderful world of Ableton? Sure. I mean, I'm actually, in the grand scale compared to all of my friends, I'm actually new to Ableton uh, more so than everyone that was all my peers in dance music have always been Ableton since day one. And I was actually using logic for like 10 plus years. I can tell you about all the music. I mean, music's just been forever. That's like from my first guitar writing songs. I tell everybody that I I started making beats on an Xbox. There was like a game where you could like kind of grid everything out. It was the first time I ever saw a grid like that. Yeah. You know, it kind of just progressed and, and I utilized garage band on, on, Apple computer uh, for the first time when I was really young, probably like 12 or 13 or something. And that naturally progressed to Logic. I got really good at GarageBand. So I just never really got out of the Apple sphere until a little later in life when my friends were showing me how to build live sets in Ableton, how to kind of get your DJ sets right by figuring out your transitions and you can build better transitions and do all that kind of stuff. And it was really like the tempo automation and the automation in general that that made me really start to question everything and i'm like you know i can make an automation i can make an automation curve in like 5 seconds in ableton is to where like is kind of just janky and not really snapping in the right spots in some other daws and mm-hmm. uh you know i just slowly slowly crept over until uh now i mean me and my buddy who also is a logic uh, user Every time we're like working or whatever, I'll just, we have like a point system, like a game. I'm just like, "Ah, there's another point for Ableton. There's another point for Ableton. I just keep explaining to him how it's just the goat of all DAWs. And I've become really passionate about it too, because it truly is the goat of all DAWs. Like I I really feel strongly about that now. Yeah, for sure. There are definitely some Logic Pro features that are really nice that aren't available in live, um, such as like the score editor, I think it's called, where you, if people who want to score music and like create sheet music and stuff like Logic yeah. has a pretty cool feature for that. 
There's some like yeah, flex. Low latency mode works a little bit better in, in Logic as well. I think it's reduced latency when monitoring in Ableton, but like Logic actually will just manually shut off anything that is causing latency. Yeah. So, you know, you don't get the effect of a lot of your plugins, uh, the ones that are intense, but uh, but still, you know that you're guaranteed not going to get any latency, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's also like the... Um... There was like a surround sound support feature that was really popular for people as well who are into surround sound and logic that's been built in there for a while. Yeah. That Ableton yeah. just didn't natively have. So there's like some pro and cons, but yeah, I, I've heard that story a lot. I actually used to be a logic person myself too. Really? For a while, yeah. And I got Logic Pro certified, which was actually a joke. Like <laughs> you could have like a like a fifth grader probably could have studied for it in the past. It was not hard. It was like a one day class. And then you take a test that's like maybe 20 minutes long. And then they're like, here's your paper. Congrats. You're certified pro now. It was like, what's not the hard certification mean? It's just like a nice little, I don't know, certificate they give you. And it just makes you feel good. <laughs> it doesn't really come with much. <laughs> There's not a lot that comes with it. I think you get like a free license with it or something, uh, which is not cool. expensive anyway. So. Getting Ableton certified was a whole different animal. That was a lot more intensive work, which just shows like there's a, I feel like a higher standard of like professionalism within the Ableton sphere um, yeah. in some ways because they take it so seriously for the people that represent the company and that are teaching on their behalf and stuff. Sure. They're but, also not spreading themselves thin trying to, you know, take over the world like like yeah. you know the other like logic is i, I think yeah. i think the daw is the least of their worries um yeah know, ableton's world is music and you can tell yeah tim cook and apple in general are probably more concerned about investors and getting more money you know with different products so sure. makes sense but anyway what, so i didn't know that daws had certifications this is kind of cool i mean i don't i don't know of any other certified DAWs, like where you could get certif a certification. The Ableton Certified Trainer is the official title. Um, and I think there's a, there's like about 380, almost 400 of us in the world now, I think. Wow, that's cool. Which was a pretty intense process. The first time I applied, I failed. Um, and then I had to wait like another four years to apply. And they do it in different parts of the world. That's a pretty common question is people asking, how do I get Ableton certified? And, you know, anybody that's really interested in doing that or yourself, like, one of the first things you're looking for is people who are passionate about teaching. Sure. People, you know, and they are really supportive with their with their trainers too. Like they'll always give, like Ableton will always give like a preview of what's to come. So you always find out stuff before it's released and they do like a demo with all the trainers and everything and the community. And you get a lot of free NFRs. It's a not for resale license. So you get a lot of free plugins and things like that. Oh, that's um, great. And access to events. But Anyway, this is your podcast episode. We don't need to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I well, to I might want to get Ableton certified someday. I mean, that sounds like that would be really cool. Yeah, they do it in different parts of the world. I want to say like every four years or so. I don't know if it's like a perfect number, but um, usually in the U.S., I want to say every four to five-ish years. But and usually, it's mostly just knowing the program, like just knowing everything about it. It's not everything. To be honest, there's some certified trainers that like, no way more than others. I think they're really looking for people who are really good at teaching. And yeah, obviously you need to know the doll pretty well. So that is a big part of it. Sure. But they're looking for people who have also created content like tutorial videos, um, people who maybe have spoken at like public workshops or events. There's like a lot of Ableton user groups all over the world. I, I think there's one in Buffalo, actually. What? It might be an awesome place for you to maybe do a workshop or teach sometime. I'm sure people would love to hear from you. And Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, show them all my just, wrong ways of doing shit. Yeah, yeah you, it, it sounds good at the end. That's my. Yeah, just don't sound bad. <laughs> Ableton user group. If you just Google Ableton user groups, um, there's like a page on Ableton's website that has a list of all the user groups in the world. And some are more active than others. It just depends. But it's a great way to like join a community or just learn from other producers that are doing it in awesome. the United States. Let's see if there's a Buffalo one. You know what? There isn't a Buffalo user group. Somebody should start one. There's a Brooklyn one. That one's pretty big, I think. Yeah, so that's a cool way to build community. And um, Ableton's like really supportive of their user groups. Like they'll, if somebody wants to start a user group in a major city that doesn't exist, you can just contact Ableton, and they'll support you and be like, "Hey, do you like? What do you need from us? 
help you find a space or whatever to just Damn, have that's these really cool free meetups it's good for the community and just to help people learn yeah maybe we have one we have one like really major studio in buffalo started by uh, a friend of mine robbie takeak uh he's a member of the goo goo dolls uh one of the founding members of the goo goo dolls oh, nice. he's got this great studio in buffalo and i know that they just opened up they started doing pro tools courses and like started opening up more educational stuff at the studio so that might be that might yeah. be something cool you know That'd be, be an awesome space. That's the hardest part is just finding a good space to host those types of events and stuff. Sure, sure. That's, that's I'll cool, I'll keep man. that in mind for sure. Yeah, man. As far as like your production process and everything, how long have you been using Ableton again? On and off for like, you know, a couple of years, four, four years maybe, but like really, really heavy for probably two years. Are you in, are you in Live 12 these days? Yeah, yeah. I did Live 12 right when it happened. Uh, nice. I mainly did it for the Roar plugin, which I really love. Yes, yes. I'm Dude. like a big Isotope trash guy, Trash Two, um, which is discontinued, unfortunately. But like Roar takes a lot of really cool inspo from that. I feel like, and there's like that multi-stage distortion and the multi-band distortion. And I really love that tool a lot. Same, yeah. Especially the envelope follower in Roar because you can map that to make it dynamic so if you have like a bass pluck or drum snare hits and stuff you can saturate and accentuate just the hits with the envelope follower and make it really pop so cool roar is so sick actually speaking of trash they brought trash back i don't know if you saw that of uh, like a couple months ago yeah it's different though it is different yeah it's very different it's very user friendly and like i kind of just like the old surgical trash um, yeah yeah but it's cool there's there's some cool i always like hearing what kind of presets they're doing and what kind of uh you know they're always trying to make something cool and I, I, they put a lot of emphasis on like the con the convolving uh you know stuff which was i didn't really use all that often in trash too but mm -hmm. it's still cool i honestly haven't used the new and improved version or whatever so i can't speak much too much to it but i do like the old kind of ugly interface trash yeah <laughs> just, yeah yeah it just looked like a almost kind of like a windows xp type of interface yeah yeah that's it's honestly it's one thing i really love about ableton in general is just that some of the most complex tools look so simple and are like they, they almost like remind me of toys they're just yeah, it's, it's so easy to explore. Um, and it really like dragged me into every plugin that I was used to using. I would always be like, okay, now is there just some kind of Ableton like native thing that I can replace, replace this with, you know, can I, can I just make my whole workflow all Ableton? Because that would really help yeah. me with live stuff that would help me with, you know, latency and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely for sure. I mean, uh, when you're performing live, I know you do vocals and you play piano and guitar. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you running that through live, like Ableton? Well, I do, are you performing? I have a couple different like setups that we do. There, there's some some that are just straight DJ sets where I'll just be singing over a DJ set. Um, you know, depending on if it's like a festival or whatever, if it's uh, tough to set up all the live stuff. But I do have my live setup, which is. Uh, we run tracks on Ableton and I will, you know, mix them with a, with a DJ mixer. And then we've have MIDI keyboard. If we can do it like a, a bigger keyboard, but mostly I'm controlling different instruments with a MIDI keyboard and then a guitar with a pedal. Yeah. Would you say that you prefer that over like the DJ setup? Do you have a favorite, like doing the live instrumentation or do you prefer just the convenience of decks? They both do different things. Like the DJ decks is, uh, I'm very, very comfortable with them. It's way easier to perform and and just, you know, get lost in the performance. But then again, with the live performance, it's much, uh, it's much different. It's just more difficult and more like kind of, uh, there's just more going on. So I kind of get yeah. in my own head sometimes about like, okay, so this is, this is 100% live. This, you know, if I don't play this right, then it's yeah. not going to come out of the speakers. You know, like there's that kind of pressure, but it's more rewarding when one of those performances gets knocked out of the park for sure. I think like 
from a audience perspective, seeing somebody doing something on stage. And I'm not to say that like DJs or people just doing decks, like isn't doing something. Cause obviously there's a lot that goes on there, but seeing somebody physically singing or playing piano or something on stage, I feel like adds a certain level of energy for the audience. Yeah. Um, because they can see like, oh, I'm actually relating to what the sound is coming out to what's happening on stage rather than it's some like mysterious knob turning. And I think that people really love that, myself included. I think it's cool you have that flexibility and you live in both worlds. Yeah, I mean, the goal is to keep expanding upon the live performance. And, you know, I kind of just get out anywhere I can. So if it's a more DJ type of gig, I'll, I'll do it. And if it's more of a headline show where they're allowing more flexibility with the audio, then we'll definitely start bringing the live stuff in more. And the goal is to keep expanding that to where, you know, someday, whether it be two, three years from now, it'll be fully live and fully evolved. That's the goal. That's cool. So as far as like your vocal stuff, um, maybe we can dive into a little bit of like some of your, we can nerd out about some of your production chains and stuff like that. Do you have like a favorite microphone you use like when you're in the studio for your voice? You have a really nice voice, by the way. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have a favorite microphone? Like what does, what does your chain typically look like when you're producing your voice? So it's surprisingly pretty simple. I go between, uh, if I want a super shiny high end, I go Neumann U87. That's like my baby. It's like the cleanest, crispest, you know. But a lot of the times I actually went through like a two, three year phase where I was like rebelling against the U87 and only recording on like SM7B and uh, SM58. And I was only doing dynamic stage mics because Mm. I thought that it, and I still think this is that it captures more of like a live dynamic vocal performance. I think that you can pick up on it sounding like a stage microphone, I think it gives Mm. it more of like a live feeling. I mean, everyone knows what hearing somebody sing live sounds like. And then everybody knows what the Billie Eilish right in your face vocal sounds like. And I think Mm. that like when you're able to use all of these tools that we are compression and EQ and stuff, having the source material be that live Zach Delarocha type of um kind of crappiness like inherent crappiness i just think it's really cool when you've got like a soft delicate vocal that's just compressed and ott'd and brought all the way up there's a really cool juxtaposition there so i'll use the ksm9 that's a sure mic and the sm7b and the u87 it all depends on kind of what is the fastest thing i can grab yeah that makes sense too. Like if you're trying to have like a really consistent sound translating from studio to stage as well, like if you're using the same or a similar dynamic mic on stage versus in the studio, you have that consistency, especially if you're using the same chain live, like you mm-hmm. can know that chain's going to work on stage as well as in the studio because you've got it right there in your project. Definitely. So for convenience, that makes a lot of sense. The chain stuff is different. The, the chain stuff always, always, uh, changes for me i i do not have a rack that i slap on every vocal ever i start from scratch every time oh interesting that's probably not smart but i really do try and treat my vocals so minimally that i don't really need one because it's always just eq and compress eq compress Mm. the Mm -hmm. only thing that i really use on uh my vocal that is like kind of outside the realm of just being native in whatever DAW i'm in is some of the tools in CLA vocals, I think they're really cool. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, they got a nice doubler in there and there's like a a cool little EQ boost and a cool little compression thing, but everything else is just, you know, compression, EQ, maybe multiband compression. Yeah. DS. That's it. I think like the microphone, if you really know what you're doing and if you're a talented vocalist with experience, like the microphone you choose makes the massive difference. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could always you could always sing into like a really shitty mic and then process it to make it sound good. That's happened many times. But <clears throat> there is something about saving yourself the work, having something like a U87 that's going to really catch the clarity and then you have to work not as hard later, building out a chain to make it sculpt and sound right. Sure. I've also just been really like liberal with recording a bunch of stuff and knowing that the source material is decent. 
Mm. and not trying to polish everything too hard. That's been like my motive over the last, I'd say two years is that that's kind of why I don't care about grabbing the, the stage mic and just like giving a wicked performance so that I don't have to think about, you know, am I close to the mic? Am I far from the mic? I don't care if there's even like uh, plosives or anything. Like if I'm giving the best vocal performance, then I know mm. I know it's going to be good source material. And even if I put the guitar in and I know that I really just ripped an, a good riff, I try and just get it to where it sounds good and not go crazy on technicality mm. unless there's any major obvious clashes that happen in the mixing phase. I usually just get something sounding good and then I'm all gain, all gain. And I, I rarely like carve and do any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Sorry. My dog's barking. Roscoe. No get bark. a job, dude. Get a job. <laughs> Come here. Roscoe. No barking. He's bored, dude. He gets bored every like 20 seconds. He's an Australian <laughs> cattle dog. So he's got like crackhead energy. It's insane. Oh God. You want to say hi? You want to see him? Come here. Yeah. Come here. You're on the podcast. Oh, he's being shy. There he is. <laughs> say hi. Oh my God. So cute. <laughs> say hi to the people. He's my ghost producer. Secrets out. <laughs> he like knows where the mic is. <laughs> he makes all my music. Yeah. He's a professional. <laughs> he's he knows a- what he's doing in the studio. He, he, <laughs> he helps me with that like 35K range when I'm mixing, you know? It's like the really upper frequencies. <laughs> he's got good That's ears. That's so funny. It's got really good ears, don't you, buddy? All right. He loves the Maggie Q 40K band. <laughs> yeah. Do you know That's about the Maggie Q? Yeah, Maggie Q is amazing. The I best, use the, right? UAD, the UAD version is, is what I've used. Oh, nice. They, like, recreated it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a lot of, like, analog emulations. Like, uh, the Paul Tech EQ. I just love that so thing. Great. It's, like really stupid simple but it just sounds nice you can get like a nice low end thump on a kick with that mm-hmm. really easy or just dialing in little tweaks of stuff ableton's like channel eq i don't know if you use that much but like i overlooked that for a long time that's just the three band one right yeah yeah but it's also i don't know what the proper word is basically listens to the input and it actually slightly adjust based off of what it's hearing as well i did not know that it's not a dynamic eq like a true dynamic eq is it's not it's not like soothe or anything like that but it does kind of react differently and has like an analog character to it that's interesting like Mm -hmm. the sweet spot of those three bands potentially changes i honestly can't intelligently speak about it but i know it has analog qualities to it that's cool so yeah, I'm not sure what's going on under the hood, but that's what I was told. Yeah, well, I'm going to try using it now because that actually, that feeds into my like more high, more yeah. low type of 100%. mentality. Exactly. That's what it's made for. It's just, you just need a little bit of that upper or lower band or some mids. That's that's where it really shines. I didn't use it for a long time. But. That's how they used to do it, man. That used, to, I yeah. mean, that's literally a channel EQ. I mean, it's right i mean that that seems so uh liberating to just be like ah you know these symbols should be a little sharper yeah it's like a, that was easy button <laughs> so you, you use waves obviously with the cla have you mm-hmm. heard about their new eq bundle that they just released i've seen it is it's not the silk vocal it's not silk or is something is it i think it's maybe the curves equator i think that's what it's called the new waves curves equator it's been, it's supposed to automatically eq your mix for you yeah it just makes the song for you they have it for like a purpose of mastering um it also i think i haven't tried it yet but i saw a bunch of ads for it it's like a smart resonance suppression plugin yeah 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 i, I saw that too i saw that too i feel like everyone like shit their pants when soothe came out and then yeah everyone got into the lab again <laughs> yeah, just like fixed all the mistakes in their old tracks where stuff was harsh and they didn't realize it until after they released it. I think we've all been there. Yeah, I mean, you can really soothe the life out of a lot of stuff, though. Yeah, that's true. You can flatten you stuff You've got to be so much, careful too. with soothe, man. That thing is like... It's, it's dangerous, for sure. It's like when you have too much caffeine on accident and then you just get nervous and you're like, oh, this is I made this worse. Exactly. Not, I, don't, I don't feel good anymore. <laughs> 
so I need to check out that Curves Equator. It's only like 39 bucks right now. It seems really cheap. Yeah, you probably got to subscribe like $100 a month for the rest of your whole <laughs> life or something like that. You have to give like your first it's unborn child. It's only $39 with an asterisk next to it. Yeah, after after like 20 easy payments of like yeah, $40. Yeah, 20 easy payments with a firm. Yeah, exactly. People love subscriptions these days. <laughs> it's crazy. It'll be interesting. One thing I didn't realize, do you ever use Splice? Are you, yeah, you use Splice? Yeah, all the time. I didn't realize that if you stop, maybe this has changed, but a couple of months ago, I, I changed my card. And so it just canceled my subscription because the payment wasn't going through. I lost access to all my credits. And I had like 4,000 credits or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. So anybody out there, just be careful because if you stop subscribing or it gets canceled or something, but I lost, I lost like 4,000 credits when I resubscribed. That's pretty crazy. You know, yeah, what would be even more weird. evil is if they just stripped all the audio out of all your projects once you unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that'd be a better business model. You'd have people sticking around way longer. Oh my just God. Like... <laughs> they would be the devil, dude. That, that would be it. They'd have all of us by the balls. No, for real. That would be awful, man. Just you get that like <laughs> that awful orange bar at the bottom of Ableton it says media files missing. Oh my god, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. That bar it gives me anxiety. I know. I wanted to let you know that Adam Audio sent me two of their studio monitors, and I'm madly in love with them. And if you don't know Adam Audio, they're a Berlin-based company that is a leader in audio gear. They've been around for 25 years and they've crafted some really high quality studio gear trusted by top producers and engineers worldwide. The H200 closeback headphones offer clear sound, memory foam comfort, and easy connectivity with laptops or studios. They have the D3V monitors, which is Adam Audio's first fully active desktop speakers, and they give you some really powerful sound with their AMT tweeters. I absolutely love the mid-range for their speakers. The A8H I'm using right now, I love the mid-range. I heard it said really well once that good engineers master the lows and highs, but the best engineers master the mid-range. You need to be able to hear well, which is why you should check out Adam Audio's headphones and their studio monitors. Just go to adam-audio.com or check out the link in the show notes. And now back to today's episode. Uh, do you have any favorite synths? I know you make a lot of synth-based music, a lot of bass stuff. I mean, it's changing a lot. Like I, uh, I was working off like one main computer for a long time, and I, I was collecting a lot of things and obviously creating a lot of patches and stuff. When I started kind of switching over to this new laptop that I'm on, I just like been going so fast that I haven't like fully made it mine. Like I, I, it would be really cool if I sat down for one day and just like got my patches and got my stuff all organized. But like, I'm always delivering something. I feel like I'm always finishing Mm. a mix on something. I'm always delivering something. If I have an idea, it's always just got to come out. It's like, I don't have as much time to just play and customize anymore, but it changes all the time. I'm, I'm, really into spitfire stuff um they've been coming out with some really cool stuff like normally spitfires like just string and piano and brass aficionados but lately they've been coming out with a really a lot of really cool like synth mixed keys some weird stuff um yeah i'm I'm not i haven't really used many spitfire synths um but they make awesome stuff like yeah spitfire labs yeah labs all the free stuff is really incredible Dude, it's such a nice gift to the world. If you want like a good violin sound or some brass or piano, yes, good stuff in here. But what else as far as since, I mean, just in 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 life, I just got a, a couple of years ago, I got this Moog One synthesizer, which has just been the coolest thing I've ever gotten to play with. I almost never have nice. to use a soft synth again, but like obviously we do out of ease. But I like I like the old emulators i also really love native instrument stuff like reactor and razor uh razor within reactor and like they've got this really cool uh they've got this really cool i forgot what it's called pan flute i think is it a a reactor instrument it's really cool if you run it through trash it gives like this really cool thing that i've been using for years now i call it the iron flute but basically it's like a it's a type of distortion that goes on this like flute sound and it like just does this thing to it. I don't know how to explain it. 
Oh, okay. That's um, I haven't played with Reactor much, but I know people like it. I've heard several people say they really like it. You said you had a Moog One. Is that analog or is that like a digital? Plugin? Yeah, it's analog. Oh, nice, dude. Those are like ten grand. That's a nice. That's it's a, nice a beast. Synth. It is a beast. Things are incredible. I have the Sub Thirty Seven over here. It's like its little brother. Nice. But yeah, this thing's sick. I would love to have one of those someday. It was hard to track down. I had to get it from some guy's studio in LA. Mm. Um, I don't think they they I don't know if they make them or right or something. No, I don't anymore. think they I don't think they do. I mean they might, but I don't think so. I mean it's got like a full ass computer inside of it. It's really wild. Yeah, that's a great question. It's discontinued. Wow. I think it's like sixteen voices, sixteen analog voices. Yeah, you can do a lot with this thing. It's nuts. It's a gnarly synth. I mean, I it's kind of nice though because like the more quote unquote modern Moogs, I guess not that modern, but you get the best of both worlds because you can save digital banks, but it's still analog. Yes, you that's know? very cool. So you get the best of both, and then using like a external instrument device in Ableton, you could just program the MIDI clips and then just run it through and just play with it in real time and just make mud pies and resample it. That is the coolest stuff. Yeah, I do that a lot. Super fun. Resampling with Ableton is like, let's just top 10 reasons for goadedness. The mm-hmm. resampling and the sampling and the resampling of entire groups and the, the, the ability to just play. I mean, like it exists in other DAWs, all the resampling stuff, it, it exists, but like not really as good. And as easy. Yeah, man. There's a lot of sampler plugins out there and sampling plugins, but there's um something called the rolling sampler. Have you heard of this? No. It's a plugin somebody told me about a couple episodes ago. And unlike traditional samplers, like it continues to listen. So like you have the capture feature in live. Yeah. So like if you're playing MIDI notes, right, you can yeah. recall what you just played. Mm-hmm. It's like capture for audio, basically. That's pretty neat. So if you like make a wild sound, you're like, oh, I wish I was recording that. Well, it's like automatically recording that, whatever it's li- it's always listening in the background. So then you can oh, just drag I need that. that. Yeah, it's called Rolling Sampler. It's a third party plugin. You can just drag that audio right into your session. That's very cool. Yeah, it's, it's kinda- mostly with like reverb tails. When you start adding plugins while there's a reverb tail happening, that's yeah. when I'll really want that last couple of seconds. Exactly. That's a perfect use for it. Yeah. Any other, like, speaking of, like, Ableton Live-specific stuff, you mentioned Roar. Roar is definitely the GOAT. Any other things that, like, are your go-to toys that you use a lot in projects? I mean, like, when I really started getting back into Ableton, I downloaded a bunch of packs. I think the packs are are absolutely killer. Um, Some of the old vintage, like, construction drum kits are so cool. Like, I make a lot of hip-hop beats, so, like, you know, just being able to use some of those are really cool. Um, yeah. Obviously granulator has gotten me a bunch, has taken a bunch of time out of my life. I've played with granulator a lot. Um, yeah. what else? Have you played with a uh, granulator three and live 12, the new one? I don't think I have. Yeah. It's really cool. It has, um, instant audio input, that you can record directly into it and then you can start playing it back immediately. Is so this supposed can... to just be in Ableton 12? Cause yeah, it is. You have to download it. I think as a pack for the granulator uh, three, I gotcha. think it's a pack thing. Yeah. And then you can have it, but the, the granulator three has like a couple new modes and things in it that are really sick. I was recording my Moog directly into it and then it instantly, you can start playing it back as a MIDI note, which is kind of fun. Oh, that's so dope. You can instantly sample like short snippets of audio into it. That's just really kind of cool. Yeah, I'm going to check that out for sure. Yeah, that's a fun one. Just wanted to let you know, Magic Mind is a delicious productivity drink and you should check it out. It gives you all the mental clarity and focus you need without the unhealthy side effects like chugging coffee or crappy energy drinks. 
one little shot gives you the perfect combo of nootropics, adaptogens, and functional mushrooms in a high quality little matcha shot. This drink is incredible. I've given it to a bunch of people on the podcast. They all love it. It tastes good, makes you feel good. There's no crash or come down. If you want to get 50% off, then use the discount code Ableton Music in all capitals. That's Ableton Music. Just check out the link in the show notes to grab your own magic mind. I highly recommend it. You won't be disappointed. This is a great deal. I've talked about it on the podcast many times, so go check them out. You've been making music for a while, obviously, not just in live, but logic and other stuff. For people maybe who are wanting to make a career producing, performing, DJing, what would be some advice that you would give to them if you could say time travel 10 years ago and tell yourself a couple things? As far as like, making a career out of it, it's tough. You have to love it so much that you dedicate almost all of your time to it. So my number one bit of advice all the time is to just like, the earlier you start, the better. And it's not because you need to be young. It's just because you have more time to to dedicate to the craft. I mean, I started really, really young and I'm still dedicating just abundant amount of times to playing and experimenting and figuring this craft out and no one ever fully figures it out. But like you do get to a point where you can be very confident in your decisions and very confident in the ability to do something. And that's where you can make it a career. So I would just say, you know, if you really love it, then spend as much time in it as possible. And you'd be surprised before you start becoming really proficient at it. As far as like being an artist and 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 making a career out of being an artist, 10 years ago, I wish I would have understood the value more of connecting just with a community and connecting with your fans and building a community around your fans and uh, just keeping those connections really close and being as generous as possible to them. That's something that I think I had to figure out because I always thought that you would just like make your music and put it out and then all these people are going to like, you know, hear it and gravitate towards you. It's the people who cultivate a community and who don't really focus about the outside noise and focus in inward. That's who sees the most uh, results and who sees the most success usually because their head's just in the right spot. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. Um, Like not seeing your fans as numbers, but just as like another, like people who have human connections and who need human connections like we do, you know, like that's a big thing because it's easy. I feel like, at least for me and other people I've talked to, just to like focus on the numbers of like, oh, am I growing? Am I getting more Instagram fans or blah, 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 more streams? There's a lot of artists that do a really good job of intentionally just meeting up with their fans one-on-one or just like making those efforts to have those like personal moments of connection. It definitely helps. Yeah. I mean, there's like a huge responsibility when you're able to make things that can create that connection with many people at once, you know? So if, if your song does have an impact on a ton of people, you know, all at one time or over the course of a couple of years, it's just not to be taken lightly. And yeah, you do, Mm. you know, gotta, you gotta really water that seed because, you know, other people like to experience things together too. You know, there's a lot of people that are, that are reliant upon that community and they make up friends. And it's been like the coolest thing in the whole world to see, like when people can actually make friends just through like, support groups for you you know like people getting Mm -hmm. together and and they want to come see your set together and then the next thing you know they're like best friends like that that's the coolest thing and it all just comes from recognizing that there is a community forming and and being as good to them as possible you know yeah yeah what are like some ways that you've i've guessed have like cultivated your community of like people and followers like, is there anything specific you can think of that's like, this worked, this really helped? Yeah, I mean, there's there's all the basics. I mean, there's like Facebook groups and whatnot, you know, like um, being active within Facebook groups, also just responding, just taking the time to respond to people. It gets tough sometimes when you're over inundated during maybe like some certain festivals or whatever, your DMs are blowing up and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, just, just the occasional response on DMs. And if your fans are saying, hey, we're coming to see you here, just even just saying like, that's dope. Can't wait to play. That always goes like a really long way. And then I've formed a community on Twitch. I do live streams. I've, I I used to do live streams on Instagram every Monday. And then we uh, moved over to Twitch. 
and have tried, you know, stepping the game up over on Twitch. And that has just helped a ton because we just chill, you know, we just hang out and I'll just play deep cuts or unreleased songs or whatever. I mean, the floor is mine and we get to just kind of mess around and, and everyone's got, you know, demos. And if, if there's artists in the chat, they send their demos, we listen to them, you know. That's cool. It's That's all awesome. that kind of stuff and everything counts. Also the like the Lalo, uh, being able to have a texting community and, and SMS uh, messages with people, like keeping them up to date on your tour dates and, you know, people send messages to that number that you have dedicated and you can just answer back. And it's sometimes it's like the coolest thing for somebody. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, it shows that you care too. And like you're, accessible in some respect obviously you're busy but making that time to engage your fans like that's awesome it's something not a lot of people do very well yeah it's important it's yeah. the only reason why we you know have we get to live this kind of life or you know pursue being an artist which is like you know seems impossible for a lot of people and sometimes most of the time realistically it is very difficult to maintain yeah you also recently launched your Blue Butterfly Records. Um, and I think that was at the same time of as your new The Dark EP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what inspired um, starting this record label? It kind of plays perfectly off what we were just talking about. I mean, I have been releasing music for a long time on labels. Um, you know, you're always looking for the best opportunity to be able to get the music out to the most people. And, you know, you go with labels and labels promise you this kind of exposure and that kind of marketing and, you know, all the yada, yada, yada. So I think it just got to a point where I'm creating so much music. I would get together so frequently with my community of fans, you know, getting together on Twitch, you know, once a week or whatever. And it just kind of seemed ridiculous to not always have something readily available to be giving to them. You know, they, they love my music and like I make a ton of music and I feel like I'm kind of sitting on all this music waiting for the right time to promote it the right way. And I just wanted to take a new approach to that. And I think that as the music market gets like really oversaturated, why not oversaturate my fans with stuff? You know, like just just give them more. You know, a song isn't as precious as it used to be. Um, it's, you know, three, four minutes of audio. and most of the time I'm just creating it because I'm, Oh, this was so cool. I made this song in like three days and I just want you to hear it. And I just figure like, maybe if I take on a new mentality about the whole thing and stop trying to save it up for this or that, then I'll just start releasing more. And then I just looked into what it would take to start distributing and just getting the music out ASAP, you know? Yeah. And the, in the dark EP, I had the song in the dark already. And I had the other kind of demos, a bunch of demos laying around. So I just said, fuck it. Let me just, In the Dark will be the first track. And what would that sound good going into? And then I picked the next one and I said, all right, now what would that sound good going into? And I picked the other one. And there was such low pressure that it felt so good to just put it out and be like, here you go. So is this a uh, Blue Butterfly Records? Is that mostly to distribute like all of the extra music you're making? Or is this uh, like a collaboration effort that you're going to try to bring on other artists as well? So for now, it's mostly just so that I have a direct point of access to everyone and I can get music out as quickly as I want to. Um, I did sign one other artist, uh, my buddy Frankie IV. Um, we put out his single. His uh, He's got some music out, but it's been a while since he's put something out. So I wanted to get some stuff out. Uh, he's been working with me for about a year now, um, just helping in the studio. And, and we write a lot of stuff together. And um, he's got his own project. So I wanted to give him a platform to be able to get some stuff out. And that's done really well, too. It eventually, I think, will become a place where I can start releasing more and more from other people. Uh, but right now, the infrastructure is not quite set up to just be like receiving demos, putting stuff out, slating it in. And I also don't want to become that. You yeah. Know? That becomes yeah. a lot like these other labels, which, you know, nothing against them. I think be as entrepreneurial as you want and, and you know, uh, but they get a lot, really overcrowded sometimes. And it, it, it seems to be more of a volume thing than a quality thing so, at some points. 
Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I was talking on the podcast with Barclay Crenshaw, and he listened. He said he tried to listen to every single Dirty Bird demo that was sent in for his mm-hmm. label, which I can only imagine was an insane amount. And he said he made it a point to try to listen to every single one. And he did that for a long time. And he just completely, I think, burned out. Uh, it's just so much to manage to be able to listen to that much music coming in when you have a lot. like, yeah, it can be tough to get your music in front of certain labels. So yeah, that's a whole nother thing. But yeah, it's also like, you know, you have to then like constantly be either rejecting people or, you know, like constantly be like, ah, this doesn't align with my taste or doesn't align with what I think can be monetary or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm treading pretty lightly with it. I can only imagine some, you know, Dirty Bird was like the craziest thing. (laughs) And I I can imagine a lot of people were submitting. So. Yeah, for sure. Props to him. He just like left the whole house music scene and now he's like, kind of like the bass music dad he's just like traveling around and like just doing whatever he wants to do now he doesn't have to like succumb to a certain genre anymore which he felt pressured by and it's cool he seems really happy just making crazy bass experimental music and playing shows and that's so cool that kind of freedom is the goal man yeah well you seem like you're crushing it and um been loving the new stuff you've been putting out a lot thank you i typically I mean, I know we're getting close to the hour, but I typically ask everybody now on the podcast to ask a new Ableton AI chatbot that I made a question. So okay. it, um, so I built an AI chatbot with the help of a, a brilliant developer. So if you could ask this Ableton chatbot any question, it could be like as obscure, or as specific as you want it to be. What would What would you ask it? And it doesn't have to be just specifically about Ableton, although that's what it's mostly trained on. I'm going to piss Ableton off by asking this question. Perfect. Dear Ableton. <laughs> Dear. Well, actually, his, his name is Abe. His name's Abe. That's the bot's name. Dear Abe. Dear, a- Dear Abe. This is for when you have a ton of tracks in a project, and you also have a ton of vocal tracks in a project, and it eventually becomes unmonitorable. Okay, what is the best way to achieve the lowest latency when recording and when monitoring recording vocals? Recording vocals and monitoring in a project with an excess of 150 tracks. With an excess. Get to work, of, Abe. Dear Abe, what is the best way to achieve the lowest possible latency when recording vocals and monitoring in an Ableton project with over a hundred tracks? It's a good question. Let's see what, see what Abe has to say. All right, here he is. Here he goes. So it gives us step-by-step five points. Number one, enable reduce latency when monitoring, go to the options menu, enable reduce latency when monitoring, blah, 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 blah. Number two, adjust audio buffer size, lower buffer size and audio tabs of preferences, blah, 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 blah. Number three, manage device delay compensation. Turn off device delay compensation. If you have latency issues, consider turning off device delay compensation. Um, It's not usually recommended as it can cause tracks to be out of sync, but it might help reducing latency. Optimize CPU load. Consider freezing tracks with third-party plugins or using fewer CPU-intensive devices to reduce the load. Use a high-quality audio interface. Ensure that you are using a high quality audio interface with latest drivers. And this can can significantly impact latency. Like the closest I've ever gotten is just getting the vocal sounding absolutely perfect with a dry signal before it even goes into Ableton with like a UAD uh, interface or console, UAD console, you know, and then just not putting anything on any of the vocal tracks until you're done recording. But you know, sometimes when you're doing harmonies and stuff, you got a lo- quite a few vocals going on. Yeah, man, as far as performing live, I mean, that's why I always stem group stuff together and bounce it down to less audio files, because then your computer's not going to work as hard and you have lower latency. But as far as the AI chatbot goes, I trained it on all the podcast episodes. Really? He's got um, all the podcast episodes? Like, Yeah, he knows, all, he knows all the podcast episodes. That's pretty crazy. It took a lot to transcribe 172 episodes, but he did it. That's insane. 
Yeah, we had a lot of help. Um, yeah, man, AI is getting really smart with all that stuff. It's very cool. But dude, thanks for joining the podcast, man. Yeah, once again, loving the music, loving the new tunes. And is there anything you want to say to the people before we go? Also, where's the best place for people to find you? Uh, best place to find me is usually just grabitsmusic.com or my Instagram or my you know Twitter. Probably Instagram is the is the leader, but mostly Spotify because that's where all my music is. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Ableton truly is one of the greatest DAWs I think to ever exist and probably will be in the future, the greatest DAW to ever exist. It's just so sophisticated and I I really am a huge advocate for it. Yeah. That's why I'm just kind of honored to be on here. It's really great. Awesome, man. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm definitely a fan of Ableton. But yeah, hopefully it's around for a long, long, long time and just going to get more wild, I'm sure, with what that looks like, you know, AI integration. I have no idea. Oh, man, I'm a little bit scared, but let's just let it happen (laughs) and see. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was talking with Ben Casey from Ableton and asking him what the future might look like. And he didn't give any definitives, but he told me, he's like, imagine how cool it would be if we had some kind of AI or something built into the DAW where it could help you finish compositions in your arrangement. So it's like, I've got 16 bars, help me turn this into a full song. And they just copy and paste and add tracks and it helps you complete the rest of your arrangement right there. Seems like something doable. That seems pretty doable. Yeah, for sure. That's what I'm thinking too. I don't think we're that far away from that happening. Because couldn't it just be like, make this a rock song and it kind of just goes off of normal rock structure or make this an EDM song goes off of EDM structure. It's all pretty much the same, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's so many models already trained on so many different types of music. I think anything's possible in that regard. So That's it'll be crazy. interesting to see. Well, yeah, here's to the future of Ableton. Yeah, dude. Cheers to that. <laughs> yeah, dude. Thanks so much, man. It was great talking with you. Yeah, you too, Nick. I'll see you around, man. Have a good one. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. Do me a huge favor if you would and hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you don't hate the podcast, please leave a five-star review. It would help me out a ton. Don't forget to check back on Tuesdays for new episodes. If you want to be the first to get new episodes and stay updated and get free new devices and sample packs and other stuff that I'll be sending out in the future, join the newsletter. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter and or check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to give this guest a follow on the socials, give them some love for spending their time. And once again, thanks for listening to the podcast. I will see you next time. Later.